Well, good morning, everyone. I think it might be time to make a start. Um, and a goodly number of people have uh, now now joined the seminar. Um, good morning. Welcome to this webinar. Um, just a few words by way of introduction. Um, we're meeting in a changing context. Um, since April, as we know, following the lockdown, the Information Commissioner has been taking an empathetic and pragmatic approach, as she's called it, to enforcement. Um, although individuals' enforcement rights um, have remained in place. In mid-July, the ICO's FOI blog announced that while maintaining that approach, they also wanted to see public authorities putting plans in place to get back on track with their FOI work. Um, when we planned this seminar, therefore, it looked as though we could look ahead to a time when the lockdown in the public sector was coming to an end, and we hope that's still the case. Obviously, however, recent developments, infection rates, new measures being announced may suggest that this might not come quite as soon as we might all have hoped. We will have to see. Um, the ICO's position at the moment remains as in July, although there could obviously be short or medium term developments or perhaps um, a delay to the easing that's been envisaged. One question to us asked directly what would happen if there is no easing, and we'll return to that at the end. In some ways, however, if the current difficulties in providing information rights services continue for longer than expected because people are still deployed elsewhere or because they're working from home without access to physical files, um, this may only underline the importance of the issues that we're considering because not only will the next stage need careful planning for when it is feasible, but the current arrangements may also need to be made sustainable for a longer period. So my colleagues, Estelle Dehone, Isabella Buono and Rowan Clapp and I will be tackling these issues um, in that order. We won't be able to answer all the questions asked. We had a great number and we've had to select from those sent in. But we do hope to cover most of the subjects that were repeated in questions, plus a fair selection of the subjects which were raised only in individual questions. Just a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, the webinar is being recorded um, and it will be available on our website. Uh, questions uh, can be put during the session. The questions button is available, uh, which we'll try to answer if there's time at the end, um, but the chat button is not available for questions. So on that note, uh, Estelle is going to take the first group of questions. So Estelle, over to you. Thank you very much, Damien, and hello. I hope everybody can hear me. You'll notice that I've just popped in my headphones because in the way of the world, um, I had a lovely quiet background and then all of a sudden there seems to be a hundred tracks reversing. So let's get into it. Uh, I'm going to try and speak just for about 10 minutes and I'm going to deal with a set of questions around delays and um, COVID working in the ICO's approach. Um, and to kick off in related to in relation to COVID related difficulties. Um, we had a number of questions about how we handle um, working from home and dealing with information requests um, with the COVID restrictions in place. Um, we had a number of authorities emphasize um, that they have difficulties accessing physical information because um, officers are mainly working from home. So for example, accessing archives has been difficult. Um, we had a number of questions around um, accessing electronic information. What if I'm working from home and um, not everything is available for me electronically either? Um, we had a number of questions around um, the restrictions on staff numbers coming back into the office and there being a backlog and how we can deal with that. Um, and then general questions about delays um, in accessing information um, and whether the ICO uh, will be approaching that differently going forward. So in as much as I can answer those questions, um, first, uh, everybody is aware of the constraints on the public sector, um, and uh, it's important that we're upfront about that. So the most um, important thing, in my view, in responding to information requests, whether they're, they're SARs um, or whether they're under FOIA or under the EIRs, um, is to make requesters aware of the constraints and to flag immediately if there will be delays. 
Um, then it's, and, and that letter can hopefully be sent out in fairly short order if it's obvious to you as an authority uh, that there's going to be um, certain delays. It may well be that you can give an indication of the type of period of time within which you can answer, um, but something should be going out as a holding response pretty much immediately. Um, requests come in and you're, of it and you're able to send a holding response. Uh, then the next thing, especially in terms of any requests that cover um, access to physical material or to archives, um, is to ask requesters, if it's pl plain that that's going to be the response, is to ask requesters if they will accept a partial response um, and if they'll accept either a partial response uh, and that's the end of the matter or if they'll accept a partial response um, and then uh, a response, a more full response. Um, in uh, when you're able to get access to your archives or to your physical material. Now, as we know, there's nothing that is uh, obliging of requesters uh, to minimize or step away from any of their rights. So uh, you can't force requesters uh, to moderate their requests or you can't require requesters to accept a partial response. Uh, but as long as you are taking steps that show that you're behaving reasonably um, as a, uh, an authority responding to requests, I think that's the key thing that the Information Commissioner is looking for. Uh, if a requester does accept a partial response, then plainly um, it's uh, good if you can do the best that you can to respond um, within the 20 days from that um, being uh, accepted, uh, to respond with the electronic information or with whatever information that can be provided. Uh, if the requester doesn't, then it may be that you have to respond to say that you can only provide a partial response. Um, it may be sensible also to bring the to the requester's attention um, what the ICO's approach has been, um, just to stave off uh, if there will be any complaints, just to let the requester know that the ICO is taking and has taken uh, a proportionate approach to the way in which she has responded to the pandemic. Uh, again, that might not mean that requesters don't complain, uh, but it may moderate their approach for them to understand um, what has been done. And Damien, later on in our webinar, is going to deal with uh, advice and assistance um, in a bit more detail. Uh, moving on to what the ICO has been saying and staying on this slide, um, you'll probably be aware that the ICO has been uh, pretty active on her FOI blog, uh, which has set out really the development of her position um, over a number of months. Um, and as Damien flagged, uh, she uh, made her uh, regulatory approach clear. Um, she said the coronavirus is a public health emergency, that we need to reassess our priorities and our resourcing. We need to retain um, the right balance between challenging times and focusing on areas that are likely to cause the greatest public harm. And she recognised that staff and operating capacity shortages, that the financial pressures uh, that public authorities are facing um, and that uh, public sector redeployments would have an impact um, on the way that authorities respond. Um, she said that she's uh, going to ensure that she uh, responds with empathy um, and then more recently, she said that she is um, seeing a, a greater return to hopefully something more like normality. Um, and uh, she's been uh, advising authorities um, that they need to start to put in place some kind of steps to deal with the backlog and return to more normal working. Uh, just stepping back from a legal perspective, the uh, Information Commissioner doesn't have any formal powers to extend any of the deadlines. She can't moderate the uh, rights. Uh, that uh, requesters have or the obligations, the concomitant obligations on authorities. But she can properly take into account in her regulatory decision making uh, the, the context in which uh, actions are being taken. And plainly pressure on resources, lack of access to information are relevant if complaints are made. Uh, and I know that Isabella is going to be dealing, uh, I think it's Isabella is going to be dealing a bit later on um, with questions in relation to compensation. Uh, so what then going forward, now that the Information Commissioner is following the, the government's approach and urging people to be uh, a, a bit more uh, getting back to more normal working practices, I think the key thing that has been flagged in recent blogs um, is the need to have evidence and for an authority to be able to evidence that they have a plan. 
It's a bit like what the Information Commissioner said when the GDPR came into force. She said, obviously, you're not going to be compliant immediately, but, well, maybe that wasn't obvious to everybody, but that was the approach that she took. It was quite a flexible approach. Uh, she said, you've just got to be able to evidence that you have a plan. Uh, and that, I think, is the approach here as well. You need to be able to evidence that there is a plan to deal with the backlog, that there is a plan um, for more normal working practices, that there is a plan if you know that your staff are only going to be in the, uh, in the office with access to information um, in shifts or with reduced numbers, that you've got some kind of plan in place. Uh, most recently, uh, the Commission has published an FOI toolkit that she says will hopefully assist um, with the, that planning process and also embedding good practice. And I know Rowan will be talking about the toolkit and record keeping um, and extending SAR deadlines um, when he comes to his um, part of this webinar. So I think the best that we can say is please keep an eye on the FOI blog uh, and uh, make sure that you have a plan that you can evidence. Uh, moving on to two aspects of the COVID crisis, which actually impacts on how requests or what is being requested. Um, first, a, a number of you asked, well, what about requests about our working practices? Um, what about requests about our staff numbers in the office versus um, at home pre-COVID and now? Because I think we can see that requesters might be making requests um, which are gearing up to say, oh, well, um, they say that they're under pressure, but maybe and they're not under quite as much pressure, pressure as they profess. Um, plainly, if the request complies with the formalities of request, you have to answer. And I think the first question that you need to ask yourself is, do you actually hold the information? And that goes also um, for one of the requests that touched on slightly a hot topic, which I'm not going to go into any detail because not surprisingly, we're not going to be giving any um, advice in this webinar. But there was a request, uh, there was a question that was asked about um, access to home office files um, and the visa service. And I think the first question you have to ask yourself is, do you actually hold the information that's being requested? So if you're asked about staffing numbers, if you're asked about working patterns, um, do you hold that information in a way that brings it within the act? Um, if you do hold that information in the way that brings it within the act, and there's no obvious exemptions that apply, um, then you're going to have to respond um, and provide the information. Um, unless you might be able to find an exemption that applies, maybe there's some way in which uh, responding to that sort of request might show uh, or might uh, be harmful, um, might, I suppose, uh, expose staff members, although you'd have to be able to evidence that. Um, maybe there's issues around personal information. Um, if the answer is in relation to a small staffing team and might show patterns um, of uh, personal behavior. But I think in general, we're just going to have to suck it and answer these sorts of questions if you hold the information. Uh, moving on to broader questions um, about COVID. So what if we're getting questions about COVID infection rates, about the response to COVID um, and the, uh, the more kind of um, health related <clears throat> scientific side? Do these requests, questions have been asked of us, fall under FOI or do they fall under EIR? Um, that is a delicious question. I'm going to answer it in the next two minutes as best I can. And you'll be aware that there's uh, the staged uh, definition in Regulation 2.1 um, of the EIRs, and 2.1F specifically talks about information on the state of human health and safety. Uh, but there's, um, it's not just human health and safety per se. And that's uh, one of my little bubbles. The, there has to be, and this has been emphasized um, by the authorities and has emphasized in the ARCUS implementation guide, there has to be a nexus with the other limbs of the definition. So it's not just um, information that goes to the state of human health and safety, but that information has to be affected by the states of the elements of the environment um, or by matters that are related to um, factors such as emissions or measures, administrative measures um, and other measures that are related to the states of the elements of the environment or factors that relate to the states of the elements of the environment. If you look at the Aarhus Implementation Guide, one of the examples that's given is waterborne or water-related diseases. That plainly is something that is related to a state of the element of the environment, um, or indeed a factor, um, and that impact on human health is plainly covered by the EIRs. What about zoonotic diseases? And I think that is an open question. My view, this is not legal advice, my view actually is that I don't think just because a disease is zoonotic, uh, 
that makes it EIR rather than FOI. Um, I think that you, when you look at the definition, the states of the elements of the environment and factors related to those, I don't think just because it's a zoonotic disease, it falls within that. And the ARCUS implementation guide does say that not everything that is touched on by the environment um, falls within the definition. But I can, I can see that you might argue the toss. It might be then, if you're taking a pragmatic approach, that you deal with COVID-related requests under the EIRs, because what's the harm? or it may be that you take a more um, legal-based approach and you say it doesn't fall within the definition. Um, whatever the position, uh, obviously COVID-related requests um, are particularly important in this time period. Um, so as a pragmatic step, I'd say, uh, do try your best um, to focus on those requests and answer them. That's all from me until the end. I'll be monitoring questions and queries, and you may hear a bit from me um, later on, but I'll hand over now to Isabel. Thanks, Estelle. Um, the first set of questions that I'm going to cover move away from COVID, although we will return to it um, towards the end of my section of the presentation. So we were asked quite a few questions about how to deal with what might be termed nuisance requests for information. Um, other attendees have touched on the same idea by asking about disproportionate requests and about fishing expeditions. The options available to you in dealing with this type of request will depend on the particular um, statutory regime that you're dealing with, so I'll go through each of them in turn. Firstly, starting with FOIA, there are three main options to think about if you think that you're met with a fishing expedition. The first is that FOIA does not require a public authority to comply with a request for information where the cost of complying with the request would exceed a specified limit taking into account the cost of determining whether or not you hold the information, the cost of locating the information and the cost of retrieving it. The limits are laid down by um, regulations from 2004 and that's £600 in the case of a public authority which is listed in part one of schedule one and that includes central government departments and is £450 in all the cases. However, where the cost of compliance exceeds the appropriate limit, the duty to disclose therefore doesn't apply but a public authority still has a power or a discretion to disclose and if it chooses to disclose in those circumstances it can charge out for doing so. The second option to think about is that public authorities are not required under FOIA to um, comply with vexatious requests. Whether or not a request is vex vexatious is an objective question and it's one which presents a relatively high hurdle for public authorities to meet. The Court of Appeal has clarified that um, vexatiousness primarily, primarily is concerned with the question of whether or not the request has a reasonable foundation in the sense of having a reasonable foundation for thinking that the information would be of value to the requester, to the wider public or to any section of the public. The decision maker, the public authority, must think about all the relevant circumstances of the case and those relevant circumstances can include whether or not the request would impose a substantial burden on the public authority. Um, the third and final option under FOIA, which I think is most relevant to this question, is that a public authority is not required to um, respond to a request where the request is identical or substantially similar to a request which this same requester has already made and the same public authority and that public authority has already complied with it and that there hasn't been um, a reasonable interval between the two requests. Turning then to the EIR, there's a similar provision which says that a public authority may refuse a request for environmental information where the request is um, manifestly unreasonable. The Court of Appeal has told us that for all intents and purposes, the difference between the phrase manifestly unreasonable under the EIR and vexatious under FOIA um, is vanishingly small. What is required under both regimes is that it be clear that there is no reasonable foundation for thinking that the requested information would be of value to the person who requested it or to the section of the public. That's an objective test which cannot be asked, answered solely by reference to the requester's identity or motives. An important difference between FOIA and the EIR is that the EIR do not set a financial limit to the cost of compliance with the request, beyond which a public authority is not obliged to deal with the request. 
The cost of compliance may be taken into account in concluding that the request for environmental information is manifestly unreasonable though, but there's not the same kind of bright line rule that we have under FOIA. Um, turning then finally to subject access requests, or what were previously described as subject access requests, um, as now dealt with under the GDPR and DPA. Firstly, requests can lawfully be refused if you can demonstrate that the requester already has the information. And secondly, you, you can either refuse to provide the information or charge for the cost of doing so if you can show that the request is um, and manifestly unfounded or excessive with particular regard to it being repetitive in character. And um, so again, that touches on some of the same ideas as under FOIA, but in not quite the same form. Before turning on to my next topic um, completely, I just wanted to touch on a concern which seems closely related to nuisance requests, albeit slightly different. And that's where you receive a request which is expressed in unclear or insufficiently specific terms i.e. that the request is too general rather than the requested information being too big. Um, under FOIA, it's the requester who is required to describe the information that they would like to be provided with. If a public authority reasonably requires further detail about the information that's being requested in order to locate or retrieve it, then as long as they've informed the requester um, of that requirement, of their need for further detail, then the public authority is not obliged to provide the information requested unless those further details are um, furnished. The Code of Practice recommends that where a request for information under FOIA is insufficiently clear, the public authority should ask for more detail to enable them to identify the information sought. A failure to seek and elicit greater particularity may constitute a failure of the duty to advise and assist. And that's a duty which um, Damien is going to return to later on in the webinar. Um, the position under the EIR is a similar one, and a public authority may, under those regulations, refuse to disclose environmental information to the extent that the request is formulated in too general a manner but only provided that the public authority has complied with its obligation to provide reasonable advice and assistance to the applicant. The ICO recommends that public authorities don't assume that they know what's in the mind of the requester and that they instead adopt a proactive approach in seeking clarification from the requester as to the meaning of the request. This could be done, for example, by providing an outline of the different kinds of information that might meet the terms of the request and asking the requester which of those um, they are seeking disclosure of. Um, now if I turn on to my next topic, which is the form and format of disclosure. Um, and this covers a number of questions that we were asked about how to go about presenting the information to the person who's made the request. In respect of each of the three main statutory regimes for access to information, central importance is afforded to the requester's preferences as to the form and format in which the requested information should be disclosed. And therefore this side kind of assumes that a request, uh, the requester has expressed a preference. So firstly, under FOIA, if the requester expresses a preference when making the request for information, um, for example, um, they express a preference that the information be disclosed in hard copy, or that they be given an ability to inspect the documents or that they be provided with a summary of, of documents which um, fall within the terms of their request, then the public authority must so far as reasonably practicable, practicable give effect to that preference. Again, a public authority may have regard to all the circumstances of the case when deciding whether it's reasonably practicable to give effect to an applicant's preference. And those circumstances can include and the cost of complying with the preference. The EIR give a public authority a bit more flexibility um, in terms of the method by which, by which they meet the request. Um, under the EIR, where an applicant requests that information be av made available in a particular form or format, it should be made available in that form or format, unless it's reasonable for it to be made available in another form or format, or the information is already publicly available and easily accessible in another form or format. And then finally, in respect of the GDPR, um, subject access requests, if the request is made in an electronic means, then the disclosure should also be made in an electronic format, wherever possible, unless otherwise requested by the data subjects. 
And so my final topic before passing on to Rowan is compensation, which um, Estelle already alluded to. And this is sort of generally, when can compensation be recoverable for failure to respond to SRAs at all or within the required time frame or failure to respond in full? Um, and if compensation is recoverable, then how much? And this was a question which was put to us in a number of different formats. The short answer to the first part of the, that question is that yes, the GDPR and DPA do provide a right to compensation for material and non-material damage arising from a breach of the various obligations owed under that legislation. And this can include a failure to respond to an SRA um, on time, properly or at all. Material damage could include time and expense incurred by the data subject in reasonably continuing to pursue that request for information. Non-material damage could include any emotional distress which the requester has suffered in consequence of the delay. For example, under the old DPA 1998, in the case of AB and Ministry of Justice, the requester had requested information about the death of his wife and the MOJ had wrongly withheld one piece of information and failed to provide the rest within the statutory time limit. He was, he was awarded damages for distress in the sum of £2,250. Clearly, how much compensation could be awarded under each of those first two um, heads of loss and damage will depend on the facts of each particular case. How much money, if at all, um, the requester has incurred in consequence of the delay and how much distress, if at all, the requester has incurred in consequence of the delay. But I think it's fair to say that awards of compensation, at least under the old regime, were made relatively modest in amount. One development which might result in higher awards under um, the new regime and as, as we move forward is that the courts have now recognised that in data breach cases, claimants can recover compensation even if they have suffered no pecuniary loss and no distress to reflect the damage to their privacy rights, which is inherent in the breach in and of itself. These are referred to as loss of control damages, compensating for the claimant's loss of their ability to control how their personal data is used. I'm not aware of any case where that kind of award has been made for failure to respond to subject access requests. And clearly disclosure of personal information infringes a person's privacy rights in a different way um, than withholding such information. I would say that the door has been open to higher awards in part in recognition of the fact that the GDPR and DPA crystallise fundamental privacy rights guaranteed by both the EU Charter and the ECHR. One potentially helpful point for um, those holding information to know is that the GDPR and DPA do provide that where the controller or processor can prove that they are in, not in any way responsible for the event giving rise to the damage, the data subject will not be entitled to compensation. This might mean, for example, that in some circumstances, if the delay is solely the result of COVID-19 and the associated lockdown, then compensation won't be recoverable for failure to respond to um, subject access requests within the requisite time period. Of course, this will always depend on the facts of each particular case, and particularly whether the delay really can be said to be solely the result of um, COVID rather than um, the controller or processor sitting on their hands in some way. Um, and using lockdown to disguise that fact. Um, that's all I'm going to touch on for now. So I will pass over to Rowan who will deal with the next set of questions. Thank you very much, Isabella. And good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm hopefully gonna provide some insight into the following three areas uh, that I know a lot of you ask questions about. The first is um, record keeping during lockdown and beyond. The second is how authorities can avoid, avoid providing uh, formal responses under the Freedom of Information Act or the Environmental Information Regulations where answering a request would amount to business as usual. And the third is whether the time for responding to a subject access request can be delayed as a result of the coronavirus. So moving on to the first topic, the ICOs recognise, as you've heard, uh, that the current pandemic is pushing the resources of all local authorities to the maximum. Uh, and it's acknowledged that that will affect local authorities' ability to comply with freedom of information law, at least to some extent. Most notably, compliance with the timeline for subject access requests may be compromised, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. However, in contrast, the ICO has been very clear that will not accept any compromise in relation to record keeping. And as you'll see on the slide there at page five of a recent guidance document titled, 
the ICO's regulatory approach during the coronavirus public health emergency, which is linked to the end of this presentation. Uh, they state, we expect appropriate measures to still be taken to record decision making so that information is available at the conclusion of the emergency, whenever <laughs> that conclusion is. So what does that mean? Moving on to the next slide, please. What does it mean in practice? There's no new or separate duty that's been created as a result of that guidance uh, or any other legislation. There's altered the way in which local authorities should keep records and retain information on Freedom of Information Act requests or requests under the regulations. I don't think the position is dramatically altered um, uh, by the fact that to some extent, for good or ill, uh, lockdown measures appear to some degree at least to be easing all the recent updated guidance. It remains the case, in my view, as the ICO has previously stated, that local authorities are going to continue to find it difficult to comply with their freedom of information responsibilities in a timely fashion, and that as a consequence, it's especially important to ensure that appropriate records are kept. But in practice, what does that really mean? In my view, it seems prudent to retain all documents relevant to any outstanding issue until after a reply has been provided by the authority and then a reasonable period for complaint has elapsed in relation to um, Freedom of Information Act requests. If the information is covered by the environmental uh, information regulations, then similarly, it'll be appropriate to wait, uh, await a request for reconsideration under those regulations within 40 days and then to consider whether there's any need to continue to retain the information. Further, uh, you've already heard from Estelle that the ICO has published uh, a Freedom of Information Toolkit uh, and it's available on its website under the Four Organisations tab. The toolkit has some bearing on this issue as well. Under the Compliance and Assurance uh, section of the toolkit, the ICO encourages authorities to maintain a log or record of requests and reviews showing how they've been handled in order to monitor progress or in order to monitor a backlog. Could also, that should range, uh, the guidance provides, uh, from an Excel spreadsheet if you're a smaller local authority, or it might be a more systematic uh, casework management system if you're a large local authority who receives a high volume of requests. Similarly, um, the toolkit also under the handling requests section reminds authorities of the need to have procedures in place to learn from previous requests handling, and they caution that uh, lessons learned are a useful tool to improve future compliance. I know, I think this is on the next slide, please. I know that some questions did come in in relation to the more general law on local authorities and the retention of information and records. Further detail on that point could be the subject of a, a webinar in itself, I think. So for now, it's probably sufficient to refer you to the Code of Practice uh, issued under Section 46 of the Freedom of Information Act, which is again linked at the end of this presentation. Um, it's the Secretary of State's guidance on desirable practices in relation to keeping management and destroying uh, records. Uh, I pause to note that one of the most effective things that I think a local authority can do um, in ensuring that they take a practical and lawful approach towards records management generally, and this is borne out in the guidance, um, is to have an effective and clear records management policy that their officers are aware of and which will include a data protection and data sharing policy uh, covering the authority's approach to matters like retention destruction and archiving. And I include the ICO's guidance on that aspect of um, the code of practice at the end of this uh, presentation as well for your reference. It may be in the current climate that if you have a policy like this, it requires amendment, addition or review. And to some extent, it, it may be necessary to seek further legal advice or, or, on whether your policy needs amendment. Of course, Chambers are always happy to assist with any of those inquiries. Uh, just finally, on this particular topic, it's worth mentioning that a lot of authorities keep a disclosure log of questions and answers maintained on their websites, obviously with the appropriate um, anonymization and redaction. That has three obvious benefits. First, it, it contributes to um, transparency for local authority decision making. Uh, second, it'll be easier to refer repeat requests to that where necessary. Uh, and finally, it, it may rep uh, prevent further requests in relation to the same or similar issues being asked. And so in a way, it might uh, reduce the total workload that you have to deal with. So I'm just going to skip on to my next, uh, next topic because I'm quite cautious of the time. Uh, the first question to address here is obviously, what do I mean by business as usual? And it's, and it's this, 
not all requests for information from a local authority have to be dealt with as a formal freedom of information request or a request under the regulations. The code of practice, this time issued under section 45 of the Freedom of Information Act, again linked at the end, um, states that information given out part of routine business, for example, standard responses to general inquiries, do not need to be dealt with at the Act, under the Act rather. Those matters are referred to as business as usual requests. In a similar way, the relevant guidance, again linked, um, states you don't have to treat every inquiry formally as a request under the Act, and it will be most sensible and actually provide better customer service to deal with some requests as a normal customer inquiry under usual customer service procedures. So there are some examples provided by the ICO, um, which give a little bit, give further insight to this particular point. Uh, some examples are where there's a request from a member of the public about what date their rubbish should be collected, or a request of an authority about whether there's a school space for a child. Uh, another one might be uh, where a member of the public requests information which is available in a publicly available document, like a leaflet or um, and in a slightly different way, um, the ability to provide a response outside the formal constraints of the Act or the regulations will also apply in cases in which there's a trusted organisation or trusted person seeking to share information with you for the purposes of joint working. So it follows the key question is how business as usual disclosure might be useful in the current climate. And I, th I think we're, that's on the next slide, please, Isabella. Thank you very much. Now, the first thing to note is it's not going to be appropriate to adopt a business as usual approach where you can't provide the information that's requested of you right away. And the second point is it will not be appropriate to use business as usual disclosure where the, the requester has made it very clear that they expect a response under the Act or the regulations, uh, at which time the, the provisions of the Act will very much come into force. But of course, that's assuming that the request for information is valid under Section 8 of the Act, in that it's in writing, uh, including electronic communication, obviously, it states the name of the applicant, uh, it provides a name for correspondence, and it describes the information required. In any event, assuming that neither of those two issues arises, it appears that business as usual information sharing will really be dependent on the particular circumstances of the request. Um, of particular relevance to me, in, in the current context is uh, the capacity of the authority to whom the request is addressed, particularly in light, obviously, of the pressures on local authorities at the moment, uh, and also bear in mind the requirement that you need to provide an immediate response, coupled with capacity, uh, there's something that you have to consider whether, whether it's appropriate uh, to provide a business as usual response. I would caution uh, that attempting to artificially recharacterize requests which should properly be dealt with under the Act or the regulations is unlikely to be a time-saving measure in the long run. Uh, it's obviously contrary to the spirit of business's usual disclosure. Uh, and, and I note as well, with a, with a view on the longer term consequences of perhaps using this approach, um, inappropriate or overuse of business's usual disclosure will inhibit the collection of accurate data on the volume of requests that you receive. Uh, and, and it may therefore uh, cause further structural problems down the line. So that's a bit of a lawyer's answer, but I think ultimately it depends on the context of the question and the capacity of the authority at the time. But it may be that if you do receive lots of questions which are, are genuinely part of business as usual, then you can rely on that uh, approach disclosure to quickly respond to those um, requests and to move on to perhaps the more substantive uh, questions asked of you under the Act or the regulations. Now again, I'm quite conscious of the time, so I'm just going to move on to the final, uh, final question. So another question that we've been asked with relative frequency is whether the global pandemic will justify an extension responding to subject access requests. Um, as you'll know, and as you'll see here, under Article 12.3, the GDPR, a data controller must respond to a subject access request without undue delay and in any event within one month of receipt of the request. But that can be extended by a further two months where necessary, taking into account the complexity and the number of the requests. In cases where the extension does apply, the controller is to inform the data subject the extension within a month uh, and to get together with the reasons for the delay. Now, clearly, as I touched on earlier, and as you're obviously all aware, this is a time of immense strain for author authorities. However, it's difficult to see how the instant pandemic might justify a delayed response to a subject access request, at least uh, 
when looking at the wording of this particular article. The wording of Article 12.3 refers to an extension where it's necessary considering the complexity of the request and the number of the requests, where number of requests obviously refers to requests from a specific source and not the global number of uh, requests faced by local authority. Um, you'll note, of course, that complexity and number of requests are just examples given within the article of factors which are taken into account to justify the necessity of an extension. But I think on balance, given the absence of a pr provision that exceptional circumstances will justify an extension, I think it's, it's difficult to make an argument that the instant pandemic is, is a necessary reason for a delayed response, at least on a straightforward reading of the article. Um, when an authority can't comply with a request within the one, one month timeline, it's advisable for the authority to obviously give reasons, uh, Estelle touched on this, why he or she can't uh, comply with the request in a timely fashion. Uh, and in any event, it's important to keep a detailed record of why a deadline has not been met and to record any steps taken to mitigate any delay. And for reference, I'd refer you to Re uh, Recital 59 of the GDPR. You've already heard about um, this, but the ICR, um, as Estella explained, does not have the power to amend GDPR deadlines, and that's very much the same for this, the, the um, potential extension for SARS. Um, but it has to date been relatively accommodating in respect of regulatory action uh, regarding delayed subject access requests. And the regulatory approach guidance, uh, again linked at the end, notes that it's page four that uh, the ICA will recognise that reduction in organisation resources could impact their ability to respond to subject access requests um, where they need to prioritise their work due to the current crisis and that they'll take this into account when considering whether to impose any formal enforcement action. Equally, the ICA have stated that as the emergency response to the pandemic eases, and the extent to which it will ease remains to be seen, but as that process is, is undergo, underway, um, authorities will benefit from drafting and referring to a recovery plan, which is still already touched on, um, with a view to reinstating their information access functions. Um, so I'm afraid on, on the question of whether the coronavirus will justify an extension uh, to the deadline for uh, responding to a subject access request, the short answer is no, um, but the ICO are unlikely to take regulatory enforcement action where the delay is genuinely a result of the coronavirus. As I've just stated, having a recovery plan will be an excellent way of ensuring that as far as possible, you're attempting to comply with your freedom of information obligations. So um, that's it from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I'm now gonna hand over to Damien, who's gonna talk to you about the three other issues which arose in the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Um, moving on to the next slide, I've got um, three questions on the duty to advise and assist. I think I was on the previous slide as it happens, on the duty to advise and assist um, and uh, on the um, requests, uh, there's two specific ones, requests for correspondence with third parties on commercial matters and requests for information collected as part of a public consultation exercise. So moving on to the advise and assist duty that's um, uh, already been mentioned, um, the question, it was phrased in terms of coming out of lockdown, but it seems to be important also um, if we're not yet coming out of lockdown as to how we advise and assist now. And Estelle has touched on uh, some of this. Just a word by way of background, you've got the duty in FOI section 16 to provide advice and assistance so far as it's reasonable to expect the authority to do so uh, to people who propose to make or have made requests. Conformity with the section 45 code that Rowan's talked about is compliance with that duty. It's the new 2018 code. There's ICO guidance as part of uh, on the code as a whole, so that touches on advice and assistance. There's also some slightly older ICO guidance on the section 16 of FOIA. And then under the EIR, you've got the Reg 91 duty in very similar terms and similarly compliance with the EIR code, which is the 2005 code issued by DEFRA. Um, that makes some sensible, some suggestions, sensible ones in my view, as to what re is reasonably expected of you. Things like outlining the information available, this is familiar I'm sure, access to catalogues and indexes, offering options, or advising someone to go to a citizen's advice bureau. Now against that background, what steps might we consider now or coming out of lockdown? These are all in the category of good practice, none of them are obligations. Um, as Estelle has mentioned, some of these. Um, 
firstly put perhaps some special advice over handling over the next period and if things change in the next week or two then maybe that um, question comes up again either in your publication scheme or on your website or both some have done that. Um, as I think Estelle said acknowledge all requests if they've not already if that's not already being done if you can advise read the timing or if we're talking about the present situation the delay because the commissioner says in her older guidance um, on the 26, uh, in 2016 that telling the requester of the progress of their request falls within her view or the commissioner's view of what was reasonable to expect you to do. And therefore keeping someone, uh, as Estelle was saying, um, abreast of what's happening uh, is, uh, is part, I think, of the, the duty in this respect. Once the lockdown starts to ease, one possibility you might consider is informally adopting perhaps in batches um, sort of working starting dates from your point of view in order to give yourself a, um, a, a 20 working day period thereafter uh, as a working timetable. Estelle has stressed the need for a plan in these sorts of circumstances. I'm not suggesting, of course, that it's open to you to change the dates in reality for replies. But if you've got something you can demonstrate to a requester or indeed to the commissioner if it comes to it as to a working method, then that will surely assist. In terms of more specific aspects of the advise and assist duty, it might be worth screening requests now to establish so far as you can um, whether more specific uh, steps of advice and uh, assistance are likely to be needed, if the request isn't clear, if there's some issue over formatting you can foresee, if you look as though you're going to use the um, uh, exemptions in section 21 of uh, FOI, accessible elsewhere, 22 future publication, um, or 22A research, where you, you're expected to, to give advice and assistance in, in consequence of using those exemptions. Uh, and act therefore so far as possible on those points so far as you can during the lockdown. Where the information might have changed since the request, and as time goes on, that's more and more likely, if it's, particularly if it's uh, information that is accreting. Um, once the lockdown starts to ease, one suggestion might be to invite updated questions in substitution for the original question, um, if the terms of the question would otherwise block the, the later information. Um, of course, that would start as a new request at a new 20 working day period. Just as one example from the questions that came into us, one authority announced its position at the start, set out what the ICO was saying, its staff were redeployed to COVID duties, so a backlog developed. Um, it's now, we understand, asking all requesters from before and during the lockdown whether they still want the information, and that's another option you could consider. But in all cases, um, as I think Rowan stressed in, 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 in a number of contexts, keep a record of the advice and assistance provided. It's something the Commissioner advises you to do anyway, but in this context and with this number of requests likely to fall within the duty, uh, it could be important to demonstrate that. So moving on to the next slide, um, this is a, a specific question that's been put to us um, uh, about correspondence with third parties on commercial matters, which exemptions might apply. And the example suggested is an FOI request for copies of emails, um, exchange between the authority uh, and a company which rents commercial premises about two things in this example, a planning application the company's made and a rent review affecting the company. And the question was, would section 43 of FOI apply? Well, I'd like to answer this in two parts. Um, the planning application, I suspect, is more likely to be EIR than FOI. Um, as information on a measure affecting an element of the environment. Most of the planning systems are brought within EIR. Um, that would then open up EIR exceptions, and just briefly, um, the one in 12.5e um, uh, to do with any commercial or trading information in emails can be a strong exemption. Um, it needs a demonstration of harm. The information needs to be uh, commercial or industrial in nature. Uh, and the confidentiality provided by law, but that can be agreed between the parties. Um, but it needs harm and a 51% likelihood to have public interest weight. Uh, and you need therefore to have a, uh, to approach the issue in a sort of honest appraisal, as it were, of the likelihood of harm, but then be confident about asserting it if you believe that it's more likely than not to occur uh, and to be able to demonstrate caus causality. Uh, and the demonstration of that harm is likely to be the main public interest factor if that exemption is relevant. The other one that might be relevant in this context from the EIR specifically is 12.5F, information volunteered by an applicant. If it's harmful to them to have it now disclosed, if they couldn't have been compelled and can't now be to have it disclosed by other means and they don't want it 
uh, given out. Um, for example, for pre-application planning advice, if any was given before the application, there is a case on that. Uh, red car, or if um, uh, perhaps the emails provided more information than was ob obligatory. The key public interest factor there being um, avoiding impeding the flow of information to public authorities perhaps by a loss of trust between you and the planning applicant, uh, which would mean that otherwise your functions are performed less effectively. If there's any personal data, thirdly, in the emails, um, then Regulation 13 of EIR applies the same rules as Section 40 of um, FOI. You'd be looking at the legitimate interests and um, lawful basis, whether there's a legitimate interest uh, in disclosing the requester or the public, whether it's reasonably necessary for you to uh, disclose this particular information, and whether the privacy interests of the individual would override the legitimate interests. Things like their reasonable expectations, whether you've got a normal practice in revealing correspondence around planning applications, whether you've given implicit, uh, an implicit expectation of confidentiality, therefore, whether it touches on their private life, perhaps, in some way, uh, as well as the application, uh, or the nature of the information as a whole. Um, the other half of the question about the rent negotiations, just briefly, I think Section 43.2 um, uh, would uh, be likely to apply to that sort of example. Um, and that would include information that the applicant might have volunteered. Um, and questions would be, or the harm that would be um, demonstrable might be things like uh, any benefit to competitors from the disclosure of some or all of the emails, if there were such, um, harm to the council's own economic interests, if it's into its bargaining position with the company, if it's in the middle of a rent review with it, um, or perhaps harm to trust with it, if it's got some other financial arrangement with the company. Um, the test is likely rather necessarily would harm, so it's a real and significant risk of harm. And the public interest factors on one side might be in favour of disclosure in terms of maximising um, income from public assets against disclosure, but again whether it would reduce the company's ability to compete with others, perhaps in the current circumstances, reputational damage if it's trying to drive the rent down, um, the ability of the public authority to generate income if that would be harmed drawing back to any kind of negotiations. And again, there might be some FOI personal data to consider as well on the same basis. So moving on to the next slide, um, and I will keep this um, brief. Um, could any exemptions apply to a request for information, including personal data collected for a public consultation exercise? Um, I've had some dealings with a case of this kind. The first thing to do, it seems to me, is to separate the types of information, your personal data and environmental information and then the residue, which would be FOI. Um, the predominant purpose test still applies under the EIRs. In other words, you can treat a document as EIR if its predominant purpose is environmental. Um, complicated a little by a Hastings, a case called Hastings, um, where FOI information will be treated as falling under EIR unless it's sufficiently distinct and not inextricable from environmental information. But you need also to be looking at any express or implied terms that you set out uh, when you ran the consultation exercise. So if you took a wide, you should take a wide view of personal data and then apply the same legitimate interest test, um, look at uh, people's reasonable expectations, the circumstances in which you uh, gathered the information and existing policy, to what extent their responses, uh, individuals touch on private life rather than public, um, or any harm or distress that might be caused to them from disclosure, um, and indeed whether people could identify them and learn more um, from some of the responses about them. Um, in terms of the non-personal data, Section 41, if any of it's confidential, if it's imparted to you on confidential terms, expressed or implicitly, and they could sue you, perhaps if any of it's commercial, Section 43 again, um, and then others that might be relevant, future publications, Section 22 under FOI, in addition to um, uh, advice on the exchange of views, Section 36, um, or 124D under the EIR, it is transport, um, if it's transport information, uh, as the question suggested, um, there's a useful case called Manistee, which sets out the distinction between the process and the, and the information that may form um, or fall or not under 124D material in the course of completion. Volunteer, uh, as I mentioned. That's what I had to say about that, uh, those three questions. Come now to our conclusion. Just before we go to that, I was going to hand over to Estelle to see if there was anything. Um, she's been handling questions on the questions button, but whether there's anything else that needs to be dealt with by any of us before we conclude.
Um, hello, everybody. Thanks very much, Damien. So yes, um, I'm just typing away um, in relation to personal reps uh, in uh, asking for information about deceased persons. I know Rowan is dealing with or has been dealing with SAR stuff. So I think we've actually got through all of your questions. Um, there's been a question about whether Damien, your replies to your questions will be available. And um, we'll take that away and we'll try and make something available. Um, although you, you'll be um, unsurprised to know that we're not going to be able to make available in writing everything that we've been um, saying or preparing. Um, so yeah, I think we've managed to deal with most everything. Uh, I'll finish typing my little bit, but I'll hand over to you, Damien, to conclude. Michelle, thank you. And um, somebody suggested that my sound may have been a little patchy. I'm sorry if that's the case and if anyone had difficulty hearing what I was saying earlier. I'll, I'll speak up and hope that that solves the problem now, just in drawing things to a conclusion. Um, we, um, we hope we've, uh, we certainly had a fair spread of the issues and concerns raised. We hope that we've uh, covered those in what we've said. If not, of course, Chambers is, uh, is open to receive uh, instructions or questions uh, and contact details will in fact be on the final slide. But as I said, one prescient questioner, just in concluding, asked the following, uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, it seems to be assumed, he or she said, that the lockdown will end, after which information rights services will return to pre-COVID standards. But what if this proves not to be the case? Well, I think the commissioner would have to give a lead if she judged that easing enforcement uh, alone, if you like, was not sustainable in the long term, or that the matter had become uh, too, too prolonged for that to be the case. Any changes to domestic obligations, FOI and EIR, although it's derived from uh, European legislation, uh, pre-existing European legislation, even a suspension for a temporary period would require legislation. I think it's too early to say whether any of that might be possible. I mean, the sort of outside possibilities you might begin to think about in a completely changed situation will be allowing more time for responses or greater latitude over estimating the burden for vexatious requests or cost purposes. Um, perhaps some further discouragement by the ICO of the overuse of rights. This is on FOI or EIR. Um, at the wilder extension and very much in the future, you know, some limitation of those rights. Um, as far as data protection was concerned, perhaps some more flexibility over time limits and extensions of time, if that were something that could be approached in common that any longer term data protection changes would at least raise the issue, and don't we know it at the moment, of discussion or at least understandings of, as between the UK and European level. All of this is well outside the envisaged range at the moment. So I hope that gives some sort of picture, but um, not much that we can say at the moment that would point beyond the sort of um, uh, outline that we've given today of how to respond to the present crisis and possibly continue to do so, as well as looking forward to moving out of lockdown. So on that perhaps not so happy note, uh, unless colleagues have anything to add, um, we will just repeat, um, do keep an eye on the ICO's website, especially the FOI, or as they also call it, the Information Rights blog. Thank you very much for attending. We hope you found this webinar helpful. Uh, goodbye and keep safe. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye.